Hello everyone and welcome to a new video. Today's video is my first post in December and my first post for quite a while. I would planned on this video going up over a week ago and it was supposed to be a grand introduction to this year's season of Copemas. Now if you're new to my channel, Copemas is something I did two years back where I made a bunch of coats leading up until Christmas. I called it Copemas as sort of a play on Vlogmas, which is when people vlog every day leading up until Christmas. Now I obviously can't make a coat a day, but I do think I can bring myself to make three or four before the end of the month and share the process of constructing those in videos with all of you. If you want to watch videos for my first attempt at Copemas, I will link them down below. And if you would like to see this year's attempts, then you should subscribe and stay tuned. In today's episode of Copemas, we will be working on making a beautiful green 1920s coat from an Excella pattern that was published in 1925, specifically Excella 1915. And I made this from the original pattern from 1925. I purchased this from a pattern sales group on Facebook and it actually came to me factory folded in immaculate condition. So it's a little bit painful opening up the tissue to use it, but I also love the idea of using something old and having it fulfill its rightful purpose. This pattern has eight pieces and is in a size 16 for a 34 inch bust. I do not have a 34 inch bust, nor do I have the corresponding 37 inch hips. So when cutting this pattern out, I ended up adding a half inch to both side edges. I also added a half inch to the side edge of the sleeve, the cuff and the under cuff. And so the side gores would still properly align. I ended up adding an inch to the center of those panels. Oh, and I added one inch of length to the sleeves as well. I made a few more alterations later on, but those are the main ones, and those are the ones you can see me making while cutting my fabric out. And the fabric I'm using is this beautiful green wool cashmere melton that I purchased from Fabric Mart. Uh, I've really been into green recently. You can probably tell by the hair. So picking this up was pretty much a no-brainer, and I was really excited to get to use it. After my fabric was completely cut from the wool, I took all of those pieces and cut around them this time from a flannel. The flannel is going to be used to flatline the wool. This will function sort of like lining and allow me to finish the seams without any visible stitching on the top side of the fabric, and it'll also make the coat a little bit more structurally solid, and it'll make it warmer. I misread the instructions the first time around, so I didn't realize that this pattern came with instructions for adding a lining, so I felt like this would be an easy alternative. And flatlining basically means you're lining each piece of fabric prior to assembling it. So each piece of wool has a corresponding piece of flannel that it was basted to prior to any of the steps you see later on in this video. So those are all the steps shown in this footage and now let's get into the vlog of actually constructing it and I really hope you enjoy. So I got everything cut out. I then marked the notch placement using a marker. Uh, I also flatlined all of the pieces and basted the lining in place. So now I'm going to go ahead and follow the instructions on the tissue and start seaming this together. And instruction number one is on the side seams and it says to match notches on the front panel with the back panel and sew that seam. So that's what I'm going to do. And then number two and three are lining these notches with the notches on the sides of the front and back panel. So you can see two of those notches there, which is also marked uh, number two. So that is going to be the next step after I get these side seams sewn up. And this pattern calls for three eighths of an inch seam allowance, but I'm probably going to bump that up to one half an inch. Uh, and to accommodate that, I cut slightly outside of the lines of the pattern when I was cutting it out. I'm not sure when I'm inserting this Yay! posy. I'm not sure when I'm going to insert this into the video, but I did just want to say that this pattern is pretty unique for the 1920s because it's printed. Now, vintage patterns often had unprinted tissue where various things like darts and button placements and grain lines were indicated with perforations in the tissue as opposed to ink. McCall's is really the only brand that consistently produced printed patterns through the 20th century. There were still brands into the 60s that weren't printing ink onto their tissue paper. So Excella was definitely before its time and one of those brands that was creating printed patterns. So that's sort of unique. This pattern also has instructions written on the tissue paper patterns, as opposed to just marks indicating where darts and such would be. The instructions for the actual pattern are really pretty vague, only consisting of a few sentences. In addition to having instructions printed on the tissue, the instructions in their entirety are on tissue, as opposed to being a stiffer sheet of paper. So you have the various pieces, you have some helpful hints, you have cutting instructions uh, and a little description of what the various markings mean, and then you have the actual step-by-step -step instructions right here. So as you can see, they're really pretty sparse, and they weren't entirely helpful when it came to certain things in this project, like the collar, which we will discuss more later on. So just want to jump in and mention that because I definitely forgot to in the vlog footage. So I just got the side gores in and that went together pretty well. I did have to do some easing at the front and I was worried it was going to pucker, but it sewed up just fine and pressed out pretty nicely. Pinned up the shoulder seams and did a loose fitting and I actually love the shape of it. It has that 1920s look to it. I think when I pair this with a fitted belt at the natural waist, it will really be very flattering, which is nice because I wasn't sure if this 
this was a garment I would actually get a lot of wear out of. And if I do end up uh, deciding this thing I could seriously envision myself getting quite a bit of wear out of, then I might actually install pockets. And if I feel like doing that, then I should do that before I've done anything to the front panel because I could remove my basting stitches and peel back the flat lining and sew a pocket into that. So I'm thinking about doing that. So I put on the coat again and I used pins to roughly place where pockets should go. There really isn't a natural place for the pockets to go without ruining the shape and the lines of the coat or interfering with some of the design elements. So I figured out the best place was about five inches away from the front edge and it can't be any closer to the front edge than this because that's where the facing is going to extend to and about 24 and a half inches up from the hem. So once I figured that out I figured out how big the pockets could be and I made a tissue paper pattern first and then I transferred that onto cardboard and I cut the cardboard out because I actually used it as a template and then I cut my fabric pieces out to be about an inch larger in every direction than the template. I hand the top edge by machine by turning it inward twice uh, and top stitching it down and then I just laid my cardboard template over top of the wrong side of the fabric and used my iron to turn the edges of the material over the template uh, and I did this twice so I have two identical looking pockets. So now I have just removed the basting stitches from the front securing the flat lining and the wool together. I'm going to get these sewn in place. So the coat now has pockets. Uh, I still have to do up the darts but I did rebaste the front edges together. I also have to bind the top edge of the gores so that's going to take a little bit of time so I think I might do that later in the day and in the meantime I'm going to focus on the sleeves. And the sleeves have cuffs and when I was putting on the coat the collar naturally flared out and you could sort of see the flat lining. Really liked how it contrasted against the green of the coat. I kind of got it in my head that I could potentially make the collar and the facing out of a different color of wool and then have some contrast going on that would be really neat and interesting. So I think I'm going to do that out of this uh, charmeuse colored wool that I have in my stash. So this means I have to recut the front facing, the collar, and also the sleeve cuff out. Uh, so that's why I'm mentioning this because I want to work on the sleeves and that involves working on the cuffs. Uh, and to do that I'm going to be recutting the cuffs from this fabric. That's what I'm going to do right now. All right so our sleeve components include the cuff, a cuff facing, uh, as well as the sleeve pieces, which I've already cut out, marked all of the perforations, or transferred all the perforations onto the fabric, and I've also flatlined them with flannel, uh, so they're a little bit thicker. So those are the sleeves, and then the cuff facing I've cut out of the darker green wool, and then the cuff that you'll actually see I've cut out the bright uh, contrasting wool. So according to the instructions, step 7-8 is close seam of sleeve D, which is the main sleeve piece. Step 9 is close seam of cuff facing A. Ten is close seam of cuff B and then 11 is sew cuff facing A underneath cuff B matching single notches at upper edges with seams even. So there's one of those notches here and one of those notches here and in the instructions it actually specifically says do not cut the notches in the material mark them with chalk or tailor's tacks and I've been using marker in this case. Also I have added a half inch to each side of these pieces including the main sleeves because they were cut very very narrow like I still think they might be too narrow even though I'm adding an inch to them um, but I'm gonna go ahead and sew these side seams of all of these pieces and then I will be back okay so I just finished sewing up these side seams of the sleeve and I used the recommended 3 8 of an inch seam allowance even though I did add over a half inch to each side edge so I added a full inch to the width of the sleeve at the shoulder or at the arm and it's still almost too tight. If I wear any sort of sweater, I will not be able to fit it. Uh, just naturally when I put my arm through the sleeve, the like sleeve underneath it crumples up and it's just not going to be very practical or good as a coat. So to help combat this, I can use a silky lining, which I do have and I can use, so it'll be less likely to catch on whatever I'm wearing underneath it. I'm also going to recut it and add another half inch above this point so there will be an additional inch in the sleeve. Uh, the sleeves also seem very short, even though I did add an additional inch to the bottom. So I'm hoping that I have enough of the green wool fabric to recut these sleeves, because I really need to. Alright, so here you can see the massive changes I've made to the sleeve. Uh, I've added two inches to the hem, I've let the sides out by a half inch, and I let the tops out by a full inch. I also cut out a silky lining to go with this, which I still have to press and then trim to be a little bit more accurate. Uh, instead of flat lining the pieces like I did before, I'm going to be seaming together the lining and the outer fabric separately, so then the raw edges will be hidden. I'm doing this because where the flannel doesn't fray particularly much, uh, this silky lining will. Also, I don't have enough flannel left to flat line the sleeves with it, so the sleeves will just be slightly lighter than the rest of the coat, but that means I'll have more mobility in my arms, so it's not uh, a total negative. So in today's update, I realized I'm stupid. <laughs> I went ahead and re-sewed the sleeve seam, and then I also sewed up the seam for the lining, and I basted them together along the bottom edge. Then I went to look at the next step, which I 
thought was sewing the facing to the cuff. Uh, so these two pieces would be sewn together, so then the top edge of the cuff would be finished, and when it flipped upward, you wouldn't see any raw edges or the back side of the fabric. But what you actually do is you sew the cuff facing onto the bottom of the sleeve, and then you sew the cuff onto the bottom of the cuff facing. Or at least, I think that's what it's telling me to do. Basically, me being like, my sleeves are way too short, the reason they're way too short is because there's going to be this two-inch addition to the bottom of them. Uh, so I do still want them to be a little bit longer than the pattern called for, but I don't think they need to be two and a half inches long longer than the pattern called for. They probably just need to be like an inch and a half. So I sewed around the bottom edge of the sleeve by machine, an inch away from the bottom edge. I'm just going to cut uh, right up against that stitch line so that way the lining will be secured to that edge, but the sleeve will be an inch shorter than it was when I initially cut it. And then I shall pin and sew the cuff facing on, uh, and this can start to come together. Or at least that is my hope. All right, so I just sewn the cuff lining onto the jacket. I sewed it so the wrong sides would be facing inward and the right sides would be facing outward, except I did it sort of backwards, so this edge is on the inside. Kind of did it wrong, and instead of ripping it off and re-sewing it on, what I've decided to do is cover up the scratchy interior of the wool, as well as the raw edge from that seam, with some flannel. So I had enough of this left to recut the cuff pieces, and then I'm just going to top stitch it along the edge where it is seamed in place. That way the cuff will be double lined and it will be a bit heftier. Uh, so it should hang nicer and it also means that I won't have scratchy wool against my hands. I'll have nice soft flannel. Also for these, they want you to turn the bottom edge inward, or the top edge rather, inward by an inch and then slip stitch it to the sleeve so there isn't any visible stitching on that edge. But I actually think some visible top stitching would look pretty cool on this. So I'm thinking I might face that edge inward by one inch ahead of time, press it, and then do some top stitching detail on it before I sew it onto the sleeve. I sewed up the side opening of the cuffs and then I turned the top edge inward by an inch and ironed it in place and then I ended up doing some decorative stitching. So there are three lines of top stitching a quarter inch away from the top edge and a quarter inch away from each other. They're not perfectly even because I'm a little bit out of practice when it comes to sewing. I've already pinned one of the cuffs in place and now I just have to repeat this with the other one and then I can get them sewn on. The cuffs have now been sewn and ironed and pinned to position. Uh, the once they are fully sewn on, I'm going to iron them once again so this bottom edge is nice and sharp. The next step is just sewing them in place or tacking them in place using tiny hidden slip stitches along this edge. So wish me luck in doing that and hopefully they won't be visible when I'm done. Also, it's been so long between filming clips for this video that in between I have acquired a dog. So I have no idea what I filmed last night or even really what I did last night. All I know is that it did not go particularly well. Is basically trying to figure out how to sew the facing and the collar on. And it's a bit of a weird collar because it actually extends all the way to the center front of the coat. The usual method of securing a collar on wouldn't really work. And the only instructions they have are arrange facing F underneath front H matching notches 5 and 6. Sew collar H to neck with center backs even. Fold through center and fell remaining edge over the seam. Join free front edges of collar and roll with fronts as illustrated. But this is the only illustration we have. And these are the notches at 6 and 5. So if the facing notches 5 and 6 align with those, then the facing would be sewn on past the point where the collar should attach. So I basically finished, or rather turned, the outer edges of the facing inward by a half inch, and then I just top stitched them down. And I did the same thing with the collar because I thought you wouldn't end up seeing this edge. And then I tried to sew the facing and the collar on at the same time, and it just did not work. <laughs> so I'm going to rip out the majority of what I sewed, and what I'm going to do instead is just sew the straight front edge of the facing into place, and then I'm going to sew the collar on to the top edge. And I think that's what they were telling me to do. They just weren't very clear because they told me to match the part of the facing with the top edge as well. Hopefully it'll make a little bit more sense once I start ripping stuff out. <laughs> but it's probably obvious, even if you don't know very much about sewing, that this is not how a collar is supposed to look and work. So I've ripped out all of the stitching that was securing the collar and the facing around the neck opening. And instead is just sewn on with a straight or relatively straight seam at the center front edge. So now I'm going to press that seam open, I'm going to trim the allowance down, and then I'm going to turn the facing inward so the right sides are facing outward uh, and these two edges are now aligned once again except this time they're not being sewn together with the right sides facing each other and flipped outward leading to this edge being finished i'm just aligning the two raw edges then i will sew the collar onto that entire edge at once or at least that is my plan all right so i staggered the seams so i trimmed one down to like a quarter inch and then i trimmed the other one down to a third of an inch so they aren't ending at the same point creating a uh, line of defined bulk press the seam allowance open uh, and then 
then I just folded the facing inward so the edges are even. So that means when it is fully closed, you don't see any of the contrasting facing, but when it is flipped out, you do see that facing. So I've done that and I've got that pinned in position. I think I'm going to mimic the decorative top stitching I did around the cuffs around the front of this. But first I have to pin on the collar. The way I'm going to pin on the collar this time is by aligning those notches, which I marked using Sharpie, and there's going to be half an inch extending over the edge. And I'm going to sew it on so the right side of the collar is facing the interior of the garment. Because once the lapel flips outward, that's when I want it to look nice and sharp and continuous. So this way, once it flips outward, it will look like this. And then once the lapel flips outward, it will look like that. So there will be a nice seam there. And then this portion that extends over, the collar is going to be folded and seamed together along this edge. And then when it's turned right side out, that edge will be finished and should align nicely with this front edge. So that is my plan. I don't know if that's how they wanted me to do it, but that is how I'm going to do it. And hopefully it works. So keep your fingers crossed for me. And I'll report back after I've sewn this. All right, so the collar was seamed on with the right side of the collar facing the wrong side of the coat. And then I pressed the seam allowance upward. And now I've just folded it over and I've pinned it so the right side of the collar are facing each other. And I'm going to sew a half inch away from this edge. I have no idea when I last filmed this video. Uh, I ended up doing the top stitching on the collar and I'm just not thrilled with it. I don't know if I mentioned it earlier, but top stitching is sort of one of those things that you only get one pass at. And this fabric was so thick and I'm so out of practice when it comes to sewing that the lines are just a little bit wobbly. And since the material is so thick here, you can really see a jump in terms of the tension because it changes right here since the fabric is heavier. So that's very disappointing. It's better in some areas than others. This is probably one of the worst spots to show, but that's the reality of it. So that was really disappointing and I basically threw this in a corner, quite literally, for a week. Uh, but now I'm back and trying to get it finished. So I don't know what I ended up showing, but I did also sew the facing in. So the front facing, which is made out of that contrasting wool, is cross-stitched to the lining, so there's no stitching visible from the exterior. I ended up skipping over the portion where the pocket is because the pocket extended slightly underneath the facing. I didn't want to sew part of the pocket closed. So there is a gap in the stitching there, but I don't think it's going to be a problem. Problem. And then the stitching just continues to the hem and the hem is actually what I've been working on today So I put this on and there was a like one inch gap here Where this came down further than the center back panel or the back panel rather So I knew I wanted to trim that to be level and then when I put the coat on I realized the back was actually shorter than the front So I ended up leveling off this and then trimming about one inch off from the front edge and just tapering that back So it would align with the uh, length of the back and then I tried it on again And I'm really happy with how it looks or I was really happy with how it looked so I marked a line three inches away from the bottom edge of the jacket and then I turned the bottom edge upward to meet that point and I really loosely whip stitched it. Sorry, I keep saying whip stitched cross-stitched it to the lining. So it's very important for this that you only go through the threads in the lining fabric uh, as opposed to the exterior because when you go through the exterior, you can actually see little indentations in the wool because it's so thick. And that was an issue I had a lot when I did coat mist before with a few of my coats that weren't fully lined. And then I'm going through and stitching this bias binding that I made earlier and was originally using to bind these edges before I realized that would be too thick. And I'm slip stitching one edge onto the wool and I'm cross-stitching the other edge to the lining just to get a slightly more durable finish. And once again, these cross stitches are only going through the lining layer, so there's no visible stitching on the exterior. So once I finish this, I'm going to press it, but I'm actually not gonna press this part because then you might see indentations from the binding on the front of the fabric. I don't know if you can tell here, but there's sort of a shadow of a line here uh, just from pressing that seam open. I don't wanna get a line going all the way around the hem of the coat. So I'm just gonna press the fold and then leave the rest. But first I have to finish hemming it. Uh, I've got about, I don't know, a third, a quarter of the way left to go and then I can move on to getting the sleeves on. I ended up letting the sleeves out pretty significantly more so than I let out the shoulder and the sides of the jacket so I might have to gather them and ease them a little bit but you don't really see gathered sleeves on 1920s jackets so I'm not looking forward to trying to get that figured out and getting it to look good. All right, so I just pulled the sleeves out and this is what they look like. That is what the cuffs look like. The top stitching on these is a little bit more even, but still not perfect. So these sleeves are lined with a shiny, or not even shiny, just like a slippy feeling lining fabric to make it easier to get them on and off over clothing. So I'm gonna baste that lining in place around the top edge just so it doesn't get in the way when I'm trying to sew the sleeves on. And I also have a couple little uh, loose threads to clip. I've just put the coat on my dress form and I'm still not thrilled with just how 
lumpy and uneven the collar looks, but it is what it is and hopefully it will all come together in the end. On the bright side, I do really like how the hem looks and after having so much trouble with hems in the original bout of coat mist, that's pleasant. Hopefully you can see it here, it's just really smooth, there's no stitch marks and it's nice and crisp at the bottom edge. So I'm very pleased with that and it looks relatively even too. So that's nice. So now I just have to get the lining based into the sleeves and then go through their instructions on setting the sleeves. But as I said, I let the sleeves out, so I think the sleeve is going to be too big for the arm size, which means I'm going to have to gather and ease it slightly, which is one of my least favorite things to do. I actually much prefer doing like puffed sleeves than trying to do a relatively fitted kind of neatly set sleeve. All right, so I went ahead and basted the top of the lining in place, and then I sewed two rows of stitches around the top edge between the notches and gathered the fabric slightly. Then once it was gathered, I took it over to my iron and placed it on top of the ham and wet the fabric and then steamed it to shrink the top edge slightly to hopefully make it more likely to ease into the arm side. So now I'm going to try pinning this in place and see how much more I potentially have to shrink it by and then I can repeat that process on the other one and hopefully this will allow me to sew the sleeves in beautifully without any puckers or gathers uh, visible from the exterior. So I just basted the armhole in place and as I suspected the fabric had to be gathered and pushed slightly to get it to fit. So now I'm going to try and press all of those uh, wrinkles and those gathers out of it before I actually sew it on for real. Don't have a lot of experience doing this, not sure how well it's going to work, going to give it my best shot. So I'm trying to figure out the closures for the coat now because I finished up the hem and I also finished sewing the sleeves on. So I'll show you that in a moment because it's very exciting. It went much better than I was expecting. But they show almost what looks like a loop and hooks the wrong word, shank button closure. And then at the collar, it looks like they have some sort of hidden hook closure. But I've decided that I want to use buttons for mine. So these are the buttons I'm actually going to use and then they're wooden. So I should be able to paint them with acrylic paint and not have them tip too badly. I'm going to do hand sewn loops just out of some coordinating embroidery floss. And I've shown how to do this process uh, in videos before. I can go through a quick description today as well. And they don't have any perforations on the fabric to indicate where these closures should go. So I just plopped the jack to my dress form and picked where I thought it looked relatively good uh, and that's where I'm going to place them. I've just indicated those points with pins uh, now I just have to sew the buttons on at those points. Look at how tall this puppy is. She can put her feet right up on my lap when I'm sitting at my desk and she can actually jump onto my lap and then she can jump onto my desk which is inconvenient because there are dangerous things like scissors and pins up there and things that she thinks are toys like spools of thread. Yeah, that, that's not a ball. That's not to play with. Yeah, that you can play with. Okay, I have momentarily distracted Persephone. So this is the loop making process. Basically, I made my chalk marks for where the loop will be. Uh, and then I just tied off my thread at one end. I made several knots so it's nice and secure. And I jumped to the other uh, point that I marked. And I tied off the thread again, leaving a little bit of slack on the thread between those two tied off points. So this is what the button will be able to pass through. And now I'm just going to take my needle and do what's basically a buttonhole stitch over top of the thread. So acting as if the thread is the edge of the fabric. It's the same process as a buttonhole stitch. So I'll go up underneath the thread and then through the loop that I've just created and then pull it taut and repeat that process over and over again, um, moving this way until the thread is completely covered with more thread uh, that makes it bulkier and sturdier. So I just mixed up some colors for the buttons. I decided that I'm going to paint the outer ring a different color than the inner ring and I want those colors to be the same as the fabric. So it turns out that Sap Green by Galleria straight out of the tube is pretty much identical to the green fabric I'm using, which is interesting. And then for this one, annoyingly I had to color those pretty much perfect, but it had completely solidified since I've had these since art class and I haven't been art class for like 10 years. I mixed that color with some yellow, with some white, uh, and I ended up making way too much of it, but I've ended up with what I think is a pretty good match. So now I'm going to paint my little buttons and probably get paint all over my hands in the process. Right, so these are my buttons. I didn't do an amazing job painting them. I kind of forgot that I'd have to do multiple coats and I didn't want to remake the color so I just left a giant blob of it out and hoped it wouldn't dry up by the time the first coat had dried so I could reapply it. Uh, but it had gotten a bit chunky by that point so I tried to save them by covering them with Stash V nail polish to make them nice and shiny and I think it sort of worked. I'm pretty happy with the color and how they look. The back sides are a little bit rougher than the top because as I said I had to do two coats on the top and I had to wait for that to completely dry and then do two coats on the bottom all without my well of 
paint drying up. <laughs> However, there is quite a bit of paint stuck in the holes, but I feel like I have the perfect tool to get that out and it's gonna be very satisfying. In between waiting for those buttons to dry last night, I made a hat, or I made most of a hat. It doesn't look very impressive now, but I'm gonna get it fixed up and it's gonna be great, I promise. I meant to film this, but I was making it like in between editing photos and painting buttons and chatting with people and playing Among Us and it was all a bit chaotic, but now it's almost done. And this was made using a pattern from an Etsy shop. I will link the pattern down below. I believe the style of hat is called Eleanor uh, and it's just a PDF pattern that you can download. I wanted a little 1920s inspired hat to go with this coat. It seemed easier than drafting one of my own. So I just have to finish sewing the grain ribbon into the interior. That's the only hand sewing on this entire hat. And then I have to figure out if I want to do any decorative trimming. So this is what my beautiful clash hat looks like finished. The brim I'm going to flip upward and then it should look a lot nicer. I'm also going to steam it into that position. The fabrics I'm using for this are a little bit thick, so there's quite the lump here. And that isn't made any better by the fact that I top stitched one edge of the ribbon in place as opposed to hand stitching out. So it's a little bit bulky along that edge, but once I flip the brim outward, you won't be able to tell. Or at least that is my hope. And once the brim flips outward, it'll show the contrasting lime green lining, uh, just like you see on the lapels of the coat. So that should tie it together nicely. So I just steamed the brim of the hat, and I'm pretty happy with how it's looking, aside from the uneven top stitching, which is a theme throughout this project. And I was just googling hat trimmings for 1920s cloches, and it looks like plain cloche hats weren't very popular. They're not as popular as I thought they were. I don't feel like I can pull off a lot of the ribbon or more delicate fabric embellishments that they'd use on this hat, just because the wool I'm using is so thick. So I think I'm going to turn it to millinery accents, of which I have quite a few. This is my drawer of millinery flowers. And I actually did a quick little reorganization there and I also pulled out anything that I thought might work for this. I could also raid my plastic flowers, like my fabric flowers from Michael's and Joann's, for embellishments as well if I wanted. So I might go through those really quickly and then just play around with arrangements and figure out what I like best because I think on its own it's a little bit too simple. Okay, that was a waste of time. I liked how some of the white kind of leafy things looked, but I really just don't want to incorporate another color into this project. I really like the fact that it's just these two different shades of green. So I think the lime green wool uh, doesn't fray really as much. It's a tighter weave than the darker green wool. So I think I'm just going to cut out designs of it and use it to create sort of an applique effect. And then I will stitch it all down by hand. But that's something that I'll do in front of the TV and it's something that's going to take a little bit more planning. So right now I'm just going to focus on finishing the coat and the final step for the coat is just sewing on the button. I don't know if I mentioned it, but I accidentally removed the pins that marked the button placement. So I just put it back on my dress form and redefined those marks with pins. Uh, so now I'm ready to sew the buttons on as soon as I actually finish the buttons. And as I mentioned earlier, the buttons have like paint filled up in the holes, but I have this little set of files that I got for doing clay stuff and I feel like I can just stick one of these in there and get it nice and cleaned up and perfect. Let's see if this works as well as I want it to work. <laughs> Okay, that was not as satisfying as I wanted it to be. The tool needs to be like slightly smaller. It's basically just, well, actually it is getting there eventually, but it's kind of just getting gummed up with excess paint and then it's really hard to pull through and it ends up just pulling the paint kind of to the surface and making it look unattractive. So it does work. It's just not the satisfying win I was hoping for this morning. So like that's one cleared out versus three that aren't. So it's a good tool for the job. It's just, you know, a little bit too wide which I can relate to. That's how I feel right about now. It's been a long year and we had a big turkey for Thanksgiving. All right, there we go. Two buttons for final edit on this video and realized I never really showed you my set sleeves. Uh, I think my shrinking method ended up working pretty well and I just eased them in there. So though there were still quite a lot of ripples, I just tried to smooth the fabric out and stretch it as much as I could. So when I sewed over it, I wasn't trapping any of those puckers and it worked really well. Like I'm shocked at how well it worked uh, and the backs actually look pretty decent too. There is a little bit more uh, kind of rippling at the back, but nothing dramatic given how much I had to let them out by so I'm very very pleased with that you can also see my freshly sewn on buttons there as well as my finished little loops and then there's another one lower down I also ended up making a belt with the same top stitch details and a snap closure so I can make it a little bit more fitted when I want it to be a bit more flattering also I realized when I was editing this don't mind the threads I still have to clip those that I never mentioned what happened with binding the side gores and basically binding them just put too much tension on that edge and caused visible puckering from the exterior so I removed the binding, ended up pinging the edge, pressing it open, and then cross-stitching it down. And there's a close-up of my pretty little hem as well. Wow, isn't that a beautiful interior? Even at this angle, it's more beautiful than any coats in the previous coat mess. <laughs> I ended up getting rid of the bin that I was storing elements of this project in, and I also came across the various ramblings or notes that I took prior to making the belt, as well as the hat pattern. So the person who created this is called Elswen Millinery on Etsy, and that is just what it looks like. And this is my finished hat. I don't have any uh, kind of photos 
pieces of this on a hat block, so I really should get some. So those were the little leaf cutouts that I ended up making, and then I just uh, slip stitched them on. Or whip stitched them on, but I did it in such a way that it looks more like a blanket stitch. It's just less work to do. So I think that is all of the footage. So now I'm going to put this on, get some more in photos, and cut to the outro. So that is it for the vlog footage, and let's cut to some worn photos. I actually don't love how this looks belted, which is really disappointing because I was expecting to find it really fun and flattering that way. But the fabric is just too thick, and it doesn't really fold properly, and it just doesn't look quite right on me. So that's disappointing, and that means I probably won't get as much wear out of this as I expected. But on the flip side, I actually like how it looks unbelted more than I thought it would. Uh, it's definitely not the most flattering silhouette, but for an unflattering silhouette, I think it's a surprisingly flattering coat, if that makes sense. The 1920s is just not a decade of fashion that is ever going to look good on me, but I think this is about as close as it's ever going to get. As for the construction, I really enjoyed the press of putting this coat together, and I really enjoyed the fabrics that I ended up using. I'm so glad I opted to do the contrasting cuffs and lapels. I think it makes it so much more interesting and fun to look at. Assembly was pretty easy except for the collar, which was really poorly explained, and different from any collar I've added to a coat before, so I did run into some troubles with that. I'm pretty happy with the construction and finishing and how everything came together, especially the head of the sleeve which I had to ease considerably and somehow ended up looking smooth. I'm really pleased with the hem too. The only thing I don't love about the construction is just the top stitching. It's quite wobbly because I'm quite out of practice, uh, especially working with such heavy fabrics. So there are some ups and some downs with this coat, but overall I think it was a good start to coat mist. And if you're interested in seeing me construct more coats, specifically one from the 1940s next week and one from the 1950s in the week after that, then you should subscribe and stay tuned. And if you want to see me follow more patterns from the 1920s, I actually purchased a McCall's pattern from the 1920s, which is also factory folded, and I purchased some green quilting cotton for this, and I was going to make a coordinating ensemble to wear underneath my coat. I just ran out of time. But hopefully I will have time for that come January and a video about it shortly thereafter. So subscribe and stay tuned for that as well as the rest of Coat Miss. Before I go, I do just want to give a special shout out to my top tier patrons who are Tass, Tracy Smith, Courtney F, Jerome Wigham, Mo Quintana, Sharon Cyrus, Emma Hargrave, and Jordan Carpenter, as well as all of my wonderful patrons, including those whose names are currently on screen. These are actually the credits from a couple months ago. I'm still catching up, but I should be caught up before the end of the month, which will be a welcome relief. So thank you so much for your support over there, as well as your patience in regards to rewards. I really do appreciate it, and it's one of those things that lets me continue to make videos and continue to make coats like the one in this video. So I really, really appreciate that, uh, and thank you so much. Also, before going, I did just want to kind of apologize for this video. Even though as a content creator, I think you're supposed to act like everything you produce is the best thing you've ever produced. I definitely didn't enjoy filming this or editing this as much as usual. It was the first video I filmed after my dog passed away, it was the first video I filmed with a new dog, and it was also the first video I filmed after finding out my new dog has cancer. So if it was lacking a bit of a spark uh, or a bit of humor, that's why. It's just been a rough month or two, um, but I hope you enjoyed it nonetheless, and thank you so much for watching, and I will talk to all of you very soon. Posey says goodbye to everyone, too. She thinks you should subscribe. It would make her happy. Do you want to let that little face down? I don't want to let that little face down. <laughs>